All right, so to get things started for our panel discussion, I'd like to go around and have everyone tell them a little bit about themselves. So let's start with uh, Viv Arya. Want to give us a start? Name, title, and a little bit about what you do. Thank you, Robin. Thank you for the introduction. Glad to be here. My name is Ar, the Chief Operating Officer of Shufro Rose. We are a registered investment advisor based in New York City. Uh, the firm itself has been around for years, currently managing about $1.6 uh, in AUM, uh, primarily for uh, families, households. Um, you know, we've had multi-generational uh, relationships with many of our clients, as you can imagine, spanning over, you know, multiple decades, multiple like like others here on the panel and, and others in the industry, continuously evolving our value proposition and the ongoing, uh, you know, client experience and digitization that goes along with, mm -hmm. with that evolution. All right. Uh, next, we have Andre Faraz. Andre, introduce yourself, please. Hi, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here. I'm Andre, CEO and co-founder of Incognit. We are the leaders in behavioral biometrics, and I'm here today because uh, mobile growth was a uh, as you know, during the pandemic, and, and and it became the main channel for customer relationship in the financial sector, right? So, uh, one of the one of the most frustrating things of any mobile app is the authentication process, and uh, we we understand that the user experience during account creation, logins, and and digital payments is pretty much the same since the early days of the internet. So. Uh, and, and it actually just became worse as more steps were introduced uh, uh, on the process, right? So uh, we're, we're solving this by using what we call uh, location behavioral biometrics, which is uh, we use something that is unique to each person, how they move, where they go. And, and we use this location behavior to kind of create a, a digital identity for, for each user, right? So it enables mobile apps to provide frictionless authentication uh, with more security because it's more difficult to steal or impersonate that identity. It's more private because uh, the data is anonymous and there's no need for personal identification and, and it's frictionless. The user doesn't need to perform any action, just needs to be themselves, right? So uh, we, we don't want security to create barriers between you and your customers and, and we want uh, security to enhance your customer experience. So. Uh, we're we're helping uh, banks and fintech startups to to do that, and and I believe that the financial sector will no longer need to decide between security and customer experience. Uh, you, you can have both at the same time. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you. Great, thanks, Andre. Um, Eileen, you want to introduce yourself, your name, title, and a little bit about what you do? Sure. Thanks, Robin, and excited to be here today, like the, with the rest of the panelists. So Eileen Holcomb, I work at J.P. Morgan Chase, and I lead our digital channels and open banking strategy and client experience function. So I've been at J.P. Morgan about a year and eight months or so. Um, I came into this new role that was built out of how do we measure the client experience? How do we gather client feedback for our wholesale payments products? Then how do we take that feedback and really build it into the client feedback loop so we can build better products for our clients based off of what they want to do? Um, so in addition to that, I lead a sales enablement team as well as partnering closely with our marketing team and communications around how we talk about our solutions. So the goal is really to have this holistic view of what's our strategic direction, what do clients need and want from us in uh, their banking providers on the wholesale side, how do we deliver that and how do we go to market with that? So it's been very exciting. Um, it's interesting to have client experience built within the product. So I work very closely with my partners and especially because this is a wholly new function for our business. So lots of learnings. Thank you. Great, thanks Eileen. And Wendy, please uh, introduce yourself as well. Hi, um, my name is Wendy Wu. Um, I'm the head of customer experience and marketing at Piermont Bank. Um, Piermont is a technology-enabled commercial bank. Our target audience are the small and medium-sized companies, um, mostly privately owned companies uh, in New York. I am responsible for building and managing Piermont's marketing platform, as well as designing a seamless 
banking experience, leveraging the best financial technologies out there. Um, Piermont is really about innovation, um, not only innovation in technology, but innovation in um, process and procedure. Um, for example, we are able to turn around a long decisioning within three days if you have a complete package. Um, we are new, um, probably the, one of the smallest bank in, in New York compared to um, JP Morgan Chase. Uh, we opened door last July, um, just celebrated our first birthday. Um, I, you know, it's interesting because um, half of Piermont's existence is actually dealing with working completely remotely um, through the pandemic. Um, so it's, you know, an interesting experience. And thanks to the fact that we have a fully digitalized um, platform, our team was able to function and we are actually um, continue to lend and grow uh, during the pandemic. All right, great. And my name is Robin Garris. I'm president and one of the founders at Nemertis Research. If you didn't see my keynote earlier today, um, our company just really focuses on analyzing the business impact of emerging technologies. So really looking at, um, you know, how, how do how different technology deployments and organizational strategies affect things like revenue cost, customer and employee ratings, things like that. So with this panel, we're going to really focus on how to deliver basically a secure and high quality digital customer experience, particularly in light of all the changes that have happened recently. Obviously work from home because of the pandemic, a lot more questions from customers uh, you know, because of the pandemic and you know, maybe other reasons, um, you know, some of the, the protests have certainly caused some, um, you know, discontent in areas that may have made people a little more leery of going outside and things like that. So that ends up, you know, bringing a lot more questions into contact centers, um, you know, unstable financial markets that we had, especially after the lockdown. All of that resulted in so many changes for you know, a lot of people you see right here having to deal with it within their own companies. So, um, you know, we're really going to try and focus on that. So one of the questions that um, I have for the panel is, Oh, and by the way, if you have questions, please go ahead and enter your questions. I'll be keeping an eye on the, uh, the panel that we have here from, or the question panel, not the panel of people, the question panel that I have here that uh, I can see the questions that you're sending in. So I'll make sure to ask those as well. So please do uh, you know, ask the questions that you have. So um, how have you successfully and quickly addressed technology issues and changing customer demands that you've faced since the pandemic? I think that's what's on a lot of people's minds, you know, not only since the pandemic, but just how do you plan to continue to do that moving forward? So um, Eileen, let's start with you. Sure. So I think with a large bank like JP Morgan, one would think that the pandemic would kind of put a halt on a lot of the things that we were building and doing as we're trying to figure out what's happening. But for us, it really actually did the opposite. We had um, two specific products that we launched during the pandemic. So within weeks, not months. And usually when you think of a large bank, you think it's gonna take a very long time to get through all of the different approvals that have to happen. But given we have all of this large infrastructure in place and the right teams, we were able to launch a payment tracker tool as well as the global launch of our virtual assistant in very short order. We all came together, we said we need to solve them because frankly, our clients were calling. You know, everyone was at home and it was a struggle, especially for our banking platforms. They're used to having their passwords, probably mm -hmm. not great, but having their passwords near their computer and understanding how to log in. And here they're at home and trying to log into their banking platforms and figuring out what's working for them. So we needed to come up with self-service tools that we had thought about, but did we think about launching them within weeks? No. But at that point, it was we need to serve the customer and we need to meet them where they are and solve these issues because I think, frankly, a lot of people want to do self-service and want to be able to solve issues on their own when they need to. Business is real time 24-7. And so we needed to build solutions very quickly that address that. And they've been resounding success. We launched, we came together, we told our clients about it and they started using it immediately and um, really went off without a hitch. So it's been, it's been great and it really taught us we can build and we can build very quickly because we have all of the expertise to do that. We know our clients, we know what they want and um, we all came together to do it. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting, Eileen, because, you know, I talked to so many businesses and, um, you know, just in my line of work. So it's like so many have said, oh, the, you know, we, we just were shell shocked with the pandemic and we had, you know, like everything's on hold now. Whereas you guys kind of did the opposite. You're like, wait a minute, we've got this issue. We better fast track something that we weren't planning to do till later, which is really cool. I mean, truly the definition of transformation. Um, so, Viv, how about you? 
Yeah, no, I think very similar to Eileen, you know, as I mentioned in the intro, we're an 82 year old firm and we're sort of priding ourselves on, you know, kind of 82 years and getting younger and more modern. So over the last few years, we have been, uh, you know, implementing digitization and enhanced customer and client experience relative to our business model change. You know, we were historically a stock picking investment management shop. We have uh, begun the evolution to becoming a goals based financial planning led firm. And so our processes and our client experience have all evolved to to support that, you know, thinking about becoming more virtual so that when we're on the road, you know, meeting with clients, going through financial planning and obviously the ongoing portfolio management, you know, functions, being virtual, having technology and process in place to enable us to facilitate those experiences. You know, even from a client perspective, everyone wants that Uber, Amazon, Netflix, digital experience. Right. Management is no difference. Being able to open uh, accounts seamlessly in electronic right. So using you know, e-signature capabilities um, for authorization, for opening accounts, for signing documents, uh, you know, through, through secure DocuSign. Uh, so for us, you know, when the pandemic hit, it was really leveraging the technology and infrastructure and processes that we have already established uh, and we have been establishing. So really all it became was just a change in location, you know, basically taking your laptops and going home as opposed to having to revamp processes on the fly. So again, you know, for us, it's been an evolving value proposition and ensuring that both the mm -hmm. advisor client service experience and technology continues to evolve and become digitized to support that. The easier we make things for our, our folks to service clients, the easier the client experience becomes for clients as well. Um, and then obviously the, the course buying technology that goes with it from a client perspective, it's been a continuous evolution. We've been relying heavily on that through this this pandemic. Okay. And Wendy, how about you? I mean, I know you have a, a different, um, you know, kind of uh, experience because of being so new. So how is this, you know, how has it changed for you? Well, I think that um, being new actually turns out to be uh, helpful for us because we have a clean balance sheet. We don't have a lot of existing customers that we need to worry about. And I think that the fact that we are um, commercially focused, we don't have a retail presence certainly is helpful um, because our clients are very used to um, interact with us remotely. Um, they don't necessarily come to our office or to deposit a check yeah. and things like that. So um, I think that the business model enables us to to be able to serve the client the same way, um, you know, whether we're in the office or not. Um, and I think for us, you know, our service model, um, we don't have a 100 number, um, it's one point of contact. So our clients are very used to just calling their relationship manager for everything. And that, you know, stays the same throughout the, throughout the pandemic. And I think this kind of human touch actually provides great comfort during um, a crisis. And for a lot of the small and medium sized company um, that we serve, um, it's also about guidance and advice, you know, just being able to talk to their bank um, transparently about their business, how they're pivoting, because uh, a lot of the business are pivoting. And, you know, for us is that how do we make sure we pivot alongside with our clients and continue to meet their needs? Um, I think that becomes very important. But I think the key is still, you know, communicating with the clients so that they understand how they can interact with us is the, the key. Great. Thanks, Winnie. And Andre, uh, why don't you wrap up this question before we go on to our next one about just how you're addressing some of these technology issues and changing demands. Perfect. Yeah, I, I just wanted to to acknowledge uh, the the fact that JP Morgan being able to launch things in in weeks uh, definitely shows how the world world has changed. Right. This yeah. is really impressive. Congratulations, Eileen. Um, and 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 yeah, like everything became digital right and 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 more specifically mobile right everyone is is now uh working from their their phones and 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 doing financial transactions from from mobile apps uh so so on our side we we saw first of all a steep growth in in terms of demand uh, as we we started seeing like most of the for example I, I'll, I'll tell you a case of of a bank uh that uh, they they were part of the PPP program, right? They were helping uh, distribute the the government uh, 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 help to to people, right? Through their mobile app, uh, but they they were having some problems with their uh, authentication process, and the fallback was telling customers to go to the physical branches uh, to continue their operation. And and what we saw was about 
forty percent of their users were were having to go to to the physical branch because it, it was so fast that they had to adapt their systems and create new uh, processes for authentication on their their mobile app uh, that they they were not able to to serve their customers right. Uh, so, so we, we started working with them. We helped them, uh, integrate frictionless authentication into their mobile app. Uh, and, and we saw that changing again, uh, users then starting to, uh, concentrate, uh, everything on, on the mobile, mobile device. So, uh, this is in phase and as Vib said, like everyone wants the, the Uber and Netflix experience, right? Uh, so, so it's interesting to see like, uh, major banks, uh, rethinking uh, things like security, for example, that is usually something that you don't want to touch into because everyone in, in the organization goes say, no, we're, we're going to start losing money for fraud, but you also don't want to lose money because you're denying good customers. And you also don't want to, to lose money because uh, you're, you're not servicing them well and they could go to another uh, bank, maybe a startup, for example. So uh, this this is a, a pretty interesting phase and and uh, we're we're excited about the, the fast transformation that is going on in the financial sector. All right, great. Thanks, Andre. Um, I want to ask about, you know, just shifting a little bit away from, you know, sort of technology as much as we can and, and look at, you know, with work from home entrenched in the workplace, how are you addressing organizational changes, employee management and training? so that you can, you're able to deliver a solid customer experience. And I'd like to start with you, Vib. Um, I know when we were planning for this uh, session, you were talking about how, well, the processes have been in place for a while. What's, what's changed is the location. So how did, how did you deal with it from, you know, especially with your title as chief operating officer? I mean, you, you're really focusing on these, you know, kind of organizational changes. Um, you know, what, how did work from home and just sort of the changes that have taken place already affect you? And how do you think it will affect you moving forward? Yeah, no, thank you for the question. And it's an important one. Um, you know, again, I think a lot of these things, even before, when you think about the technology, stem back from, you know, what's the process, right? What is the most streamlined, efficient way to open accounts? What is the most, uh, you know, efficient, but also compliant way to send money out to clients when they, you know, request the wire or some kind of an EFT or check? Um, you know, how do we even close accounts quickly when we need to? Um, and so everything has a process tied to it. And you think about the efficiency and the step-by-step -step processes that go in place in terms of just defining the process. And then you leverage the technology to build those workflows. And so for us, you know, we have built workflows for every one of these operational processes. So there's a step-by-step -step digital process for how we open an account. How do we wire an account, ensuring that we've got the right compliance guardrails in place, um, you know, whether it's confirming, the request from the client verbally on the phone number of record that we have as opposed to what was provided to us in an email let's say right so we've got all these compliance guardrails we've got different thresholds of approvals you know there's certain mm -hmm. you know high high volume uh, high value uh, uh, disbursements that our chief compliance officer has to approve and so what we've built out uh, robin to answer your question are digital workflows where in in reality the workflows almost drive the process and so from a training perspective you know when you know John Doe as a user goes in and submits a request, the workflow then takes him or her through the process. And so it's almost, you know, less left up to guesswork or, or manual intervention or needing to know the process, but the, the workflow guides you. And so I think it's just that upfront work, some of the change management work around just defining process, implementing some of these enhanced pro, you know, processes, and then having the technology automate this for you. I think it, you know, again, becomes a training resource. A lot of our operations manual has become these digital workflows. And so while we do have a referenced, you know, Word document, let's say, or a PDF document of an operations manual, the day-to-day -day workflows that we execute in our technology is in essence the training, you know, manual, the workflow, and 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 the operating manual for us. Yeah, I mean, I had a question earlier that talked about, you know, some of the processes that are changing as companies go to home offices. That, like, say, in a contact center where you might have an agent doing a split shift. You know, maybe they're working a few hours in the morning, a few hours in the afternoon, a few hours in the evening, which is, you know, to some people that works real well with their life. Like, have their they don't have a start and end point to their work life. It's kind of integrated into their personal life, so they can address personal, you know, kids or parents or whatever they have to do. And um, you know, to some people that might be a really hard thing to do. To others, it's easy. But I think from an operational standpoint, it definitely takes some work to be done. You know, just in uh, scheduling programs and things like that, uh, you know, just to make that all work. Um, I don't know if you have any yeah, thoughts no, on it, that. Yeah. Yeah, no, it does. And, and again, for us, you know, yeah. it, it's sort of, sort of different because I guess 
context and a shift perspective, but it's the same thing that, you know, kind of when he said, we are very high touch. And so again, you know, we have to be accessible to our clients. And um, again, yeah. the technology helps us do that, right? So again, even things like CRM, you know, just having notes and, and tasks documented there are, are, you know, client relationship management tool. And again, look, we're, we're in the summer months now where people are finally getting a chance to take vacation, right? I mean, yeah. obviously there was this period of time and, you know, March, April, May, where no one went anywhere, no one did it because, hey, you were just trying to keep things afloat, but also, you know, just the circumstances of everything being locked down, you couldn't. So now we've got sort of yeah. in mass, people wanting to take some summer months off now or, or the remaining summer weeks that they have. And so again, having these things documented in our CRM tool or our workflow tools, yeah. you know, Robin, to answer your point, people can pick up and just, you know, return the phone yeah. call if the previous person was on vacation or is out, you know? And so again, leveraging digitization of these kinds of, you know, even just tasks, notes, et cetera, and the discipline that goes with it, you know, and I can't emphasize that enough. I mean, you can have all the great technology in place, but if you don't have the discipline for people to follow it, as well as the culture of adoption to embrace technology, and I think that's what a lot of people to embrace technology when in previous times they may have been sort of resistant because they, they never needed to, right? You could do the old manual yeah. ways of, of things, mm -hmm. but now you had no choice. And so I think what we're seeing is just high adoption and then the ROI and the value of the time spent in learning technology and interest that throughput you get as a result. Great. I mean, what have you guys done at JP Morgan Chase just in, in terms of, you know, organizational changes, um, particularly maybe you can talk about video are you how much to what extent are you using video to either train you know employees remotely or even managers um you know maybe even uh resetting the customer expectations for what they are going to do are they going to do in-person meetings are they going to go you know into a branch are they going to do something differently how, how have you guys addressed that absolutely so the one, um, well, not one, but one of many benefits of JP Morgan, we were already using video for calls. So when the pandemic hit, we used video phones within um, our offices and our desks and things like that. So it wasn't that much of a change. It was kind of changing some of the video software. But I think that really helped us because we were used to seeing people and interacting, you know, especially when you get to the end of the day and you have Zoom fatigue. Like, oh, I've been used to this for a while now, you know, where you're, you're constantly on video. But we've really taken it to the next level. We've done, um, I would say two things. One, internally, like I said, I do a lot of sales enablement and communications. So how do we make salespeople are aware of what's getting out there? You know, you don't have those um, touch points that you would have running into someone in the hallway or yeah. having um, 101 sessions around what's coming. So we actually launched a demo day where we had all of our teams say, here's what's coming up. Here's what you can hear. And we compressed it into a short amount of time and let everyone go through and understand what is coming? What can their clients expect? And to let people know we're still working. You know, this isn't just stopping our development, our innovation, none of that stops. So again, very strict protocol on how it works in Zoom because we have to say, you know, here, here's how much time you have. And after that, we have yeah. to kind of cut you off and that sort of thing. But we're learning those communications quite well. The second thing I would say externally from a client perspective is we've done a lot of client research. And so in the, we might have brought clients to our innovation lab and have them try out new solutions so we can watch their interactions, what works, what doesn't, and have those conversations. But with the pandemic, obviously things have changed. So luckily we had been planning to do things virtually anyways. So like when he said before, it it kind of worked out. We're starting to build towards that way for banking in general. And we've been doing virtual testing with clients where we're having them share their desktop, you know, and we're going through prototypes and saying, what do you like? What do you not like? How does this work? How would you prefer it? Work? So you're still having that personal interaction over video a little bit different than in, you know, in person in an innovation lab. But it's worked really phenomenally and it really tells clients we're still focused on, you know, working on what makes sense for you. And given the pandemic, I think focus areas have changed, needs have changed. So clients have been very open to giving us feedback around what's been challenging, how we can make things easier for them. And I think they really like the engagement as well. Our salespeople were so delighted to be able to give us names of, hey, this client would love to give feedback. And then having those conversations like this with them and showing them things has really worked out very well. So we're continuing to build those personal connections just in a different way. Excellent. So 
So, Wendy, how about you with um, having a newer bank? I mean, has this helped or hurt you when you t look at the organizational issues and, you know, like the training and management issues? Yeah, so um, our team actually continued to grow uh, during the pandemic. So I have about 20% um, of new colleagues um, who mm -hmm. were hired during pan the pandemic where we have never met in person, even though I talk to them all the time. Um, but, you know, they have never been to the office. They, you know, yeah. were interviewed via Zoom. They did not, you know, get to be and have that experience of walking into our office and, you know, meet the rest of the team. So I think that one thing uh, I echo what Eileen was saying is that informal touch point, um, you know, mm -hmm. not having that informal interactions with your colleague. I think that is certainly something that we try to make up during the um, working from home stage is, you know, through hosting um, virtual happy hours, um, to not talk about work, but to talk about how you're doing, right? right. Like, you know, how the day been like um, since we haven't seen each other for this long? You know, what are some of the challenges that you have? I think offer the um, platform for um, employees and for the whole entire team to be able to, you know, share um, more informally, it was very helpful. Um, and also, I think that, you know, um, how do we continue to um, build the right company culture that we want um, now that we don't have you know everyone in the office that we um, cannot do team building exercise but you know like we're trying to find out alternative ways um, to make up for that um, and I think the tone really gets set from the top is that the management team has made a conscious effort to make sure that everyone is engaged to make sure that you know people know what's going on um, we have actually daily calls um, the whole entire senior, senior management team to just talk about issues and what needs to be done so we know what each other is working on so that we continue to have the same collaboration that we have um, when we were in the office. Now, Andre, I would like to just switch gears a little bit and have you um, sort of launch into a, another area, because as we think about all these organizations serving their customers digitally and gathering feedback, how do you ensure a secure interaction? And, um, you know, I, I think you have some good comments to talk about here, but, you know, how do you really rethink security on, on what do you really need and what don't you need? You know, in light Perfect. of this whole new world that yeah. we live in, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. Well, uh, first of all, I think that uh, for for the most part of the, the, the internet in general, uh, security was thought as, um, creating barriers right and 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 creating steps for for the user to 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 go through to prove them that they are themselves for example um but but obviously the problem with that is that on the other hand you you start denying good customers you start also um providing not not the best customer experience right so um what what we're seeing is that uh, for example, the mobile device, uh, this is the a device that has so many different sensors, right? And uh, it, it, can, it can collect so much behavioral information uh, about like how a user type, for example, this, this is my metrics, like so analyzing keystrokes and like how the user holds the phone, for example, that, that is something that uh, is, is likely to be unique to each person or at least very, very similar to, to, to yourself. Um, but also how you move, where you spend most of your time, your routine. Uh, so a mobile device can understand everything about it, right? So um, it this is, at least in my opinion, by far much more uh, secure than things like logins and passwords, right? Or, or uh, two-factor authentication using SMS or other techniques um, because this only creates friction and uh, the 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 people who are professional, like the fraudsters, they already know how to break those things, right? They they have been trained to do that. So so in the end of the day, you you end up having uh, fraudsters who who keep doing their job. They they will keep breaking those things, um, and good users will will stay out, right? So uh, we are thinking this, and and with with other players in the industry, on how can you leverage those sensors that I've mentioned. Uh, to, mm -hmm. to create kind of a behavioral profile um, and based on that, uh, authenticate the user, prove that the user is really who, who they say they are. So uh, I, I think it's a new way of, of thinking about security. 
um, and and most importantly, trying to combine uh, the the best that we have here on on the mobile device uh, to 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 provide a good customer experience without having to 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 balance it between this and security. Right? Yeah, Robin, if I could just add one comment, because I think what Andre yeah, said is, is, is spot on, you know, but I think even, you know, um, just sort of from a non-technology perspective, and I'm sure you all have experiences as well. I mean, I can't tell you the increase we just received at our firm in terms of just fishing expeditions. You know, I think people were taking advantage of the fact that everyone was home and perhaps a little bit more susceptible to clicking on links, right? Just thinking it's it's viable. And so just even the little things, along with all the technology, you know, items that, that Andre mentioned is just, you know, around awareness, right? You know, showing people examples yeah. of what phishing looks like internally, as well as, you know, when we, you know, as I mentioned earlier, disperse, you know, funds out of a client's account, explaining to clients why we're calling them to, to validate the request, right? And to verify the request. And so I think the point that Andre made around friction of customer experience to kind of bad security protocols is so important in terms of matching expectations with clients to say, look, even though it may take an extra 10 minutes to get the wire out because we need to speak with you first, here's how we're safeguarding your identity, your assets, mm -hmm. you know, and, and so I think it's it's also just some fine tune uh, balancing of, of just matching expectations and explaining some of these protocols that we have in place. Yeah. Uh, so and I, I, I wanted to add one. Oh, sorry. Uh, just, just one thing that uh, was interesting, which is, uh, in for most most uh, of the time, we we have been saying that the the weak link in security is the end user, right? Um, and and what I think we can do with those sensors on on the phone is actually to transform that weak link, which is the user, into strong link, which is uh, your behavior is unique, right? And so, how can we use what is unique about you to be, to make the end user? becomes the strong link in security. And then we start eliminating traditional things like logins and passwords, which today it's pretty easy to, to discover for someone. Yeah, Wendy, go ahead. I think you were about to say something as well. Yeah, I was gonna uh, echo what Vic said. I think, you know, he pointed out a great point about risk management. You know, as we were building um, the bank, um, a lot of the times is thinking about, yes, we want to build the best customer experience. We want to make things a lot easier for, for clients, but we always have to keep in mind, you know, there are certain things that is risk management that we just have to continue to inform. But I think, you know, coming from um, everybody that is in the highly regulated, you know, banking industry, I think we're all very used to, okay, this, we have to do certain things because of compliance. We have to do certain things because it's a, you know, regulation. But I think that, you know, some of the existing process and procedure were there because of a specific time because of a specific technology i mean when we first you know starting um building and writing procedures i mean there was mention of wrong like i was like really do people still use that and but you know like so those are things that we can think about sure we'll retire them we'll retire them like mm -hmm. they are no longer apply to you know how we interact with clients nowadays but there are certain things you know like wire you know biggest fraud that we, I think we all deal with in the banking industry. That's something that we have to continue to educate our clients that, no, we have to call you back. We have to make sure that we call you back on the number that you provided because that is risk management. It's also for, for your safety that you know right. we are responsible for. Right. I think that's a good point, Wenny, because from my perspective, we've taught our clients extremely well because when we reach out for feedback, we send feedback surveys or ask them to participate in research studies. A lot of times now, our clients will then email their relationship manager to say, is this a real person? Can I respond to this? So it's like we're swinging the pendulum and we've taught them so yeah. much about phishing. Even internally, that's happened where I'm sending you know, a research survey to someone, some one of my internal colleagues and they're like, is this real? Did this, who did this come from? So we're trying to get around that and make sure we're super educating, um, super educated in how we talk to our clients around research and what we're doing and who we are um, because we've taught them so well. So it's worked out. Um, it's worked out well, you know, I think that they understand. And I think when we've talked with clients about, do you prefer a better client experience or more secure? 
you know, it's, it's the battle of the two, right? Sometimes the more security can be a little bit more friction, as Andre said, but it doesn't have to be that way. So if we start thinking outside the box and really talk with clients around how they want to work, taking inspiration, at least from JP Morgan, from the consumer side and how clients work over there, it, it'll make a huge difference here. Yeah. I absolutely agree. Um, and I think, you know, one more thing I want to add is also about, you know, the customization because each client is so different and they prefer to be, you know, serve or interact with the bank um, in a different way. So I think that we all try to customize that experience for, for each client and which is an important part that we're trying to, to do. All right. So when we think about um, security, obviously, we also have to think about mobile security because a lot of customers are on the go. So what are you doing to ensure mobile interactions are secure, um, but you're also at the same time delivering customer experience? It's like, you know, you're always kind of weighing the two. You want a good customer experience and you want to make sure it's very secure on a mobile device. There's a lot of different pieces at play there, um, you know, so what, what do you guys think there? Um, I know, uh, I don't know, we started with Andre before, but I, I remember during our discussion, he had some good points here about, you know, making sure those security requirements are not annoying to customers, but, you know, that the, the transactions still meet regulatory requirements. Maybe have some comments there and then everyone else can kind of jump in as you, as you'd like. Okay, cool. Well, um, yeah, we, we have been seeing uh, a, a lot of different approaches from, from customers, uh, but but generally uh, what I'm seeing is that every, everyone wants to remove steps, right? Everyone wants to remove some, some step from, from the process. Uh, I, I would say that, for example, uh, during account origination, uh, we, we see a lot of, of apps uh, starting to deploy things like um, biometrics, facial recognition, and, and other things. Uh, thinking that it's going to help the customer experience, but maybe like, for example, with, with facial recognition, uh, we, we were talking to a bank that adopted it and, and it started having a lot of false positives, maybe something that was mm -hmm. wrong in the model. They started then denying more customers than before. Um, so, so they came back to using uh, uh, other, other techniques like uh, uh, requiring pictures of, of documents and things like that. So uh it, so so every everyone is trying to to find like different combinations of of techniques but in general what we have seen is that more and more they're substituting some of those uh old techniques for for things that that don't have that much friction so um in our case uh the main things that we're seeing is uh for example using behavioral uh information to verify addresses right uh, because today there, there are a lot of technologies that do, do a pretty good job on, on uh, matching your social security number to your name and to your uh, address and things like that. But that could be a synthetic identity or, or still an identity, right? It, it could be me using your yeah. data to create an account. So what, what do we do here? We're using behavior information to link uh, the information that you are disclosing to, to the mobile app while you're creating the account to the device uh, in which you're uh, doing that operation. So for example, when you type the address, we're going to see if your phone's location, if the history matches to that address, for example. If it does, okay, that's that's probably you. Uh, we're able to authorize you. And what, what uh, have you done? You simply type your, your address, right? Not Nothing more than that. Uh, one other thing that we're seeing in, in logins, uh, which us usually require you to uh, type a one-type password to that that is sent to your email or to your phone number uh, through SMS, for example. Uh, we're starting to see um, many customers removing that part of the process and substituting it by, uh, uh, with uh, location behavior biometrics, for example. So uh, if I'm logging into my bank and I'm at home, for example, uh, this is the safest location to be. Right? So why don't we simply authorize that you without any additional step right um so, so another scenario other final final year which is pretty interesting is uh payments uh we're seeing very very growth uh in many different markets 
uh, uh, for mobile payments, uh, specifically the contactless payments, uh, COVID, right? You, you don't want to be uh, typing a PIN number uh, to, to a machine that a lot of people touch it, for example. Um, so, so we're starting to really transfer our mobile devices on, on reels. Um, and, and we're simply like entering a place the, the moment we exit that uh, physical store, for example, uh, the payment is going to happen in real time uh, as as we leave the the place. So so the user is not having to type anything on any different machine. Uh, their their phone is becoming kind of their token for for the life. Yeah, if I can sort of add to to the conversation here, um, and I think we've got a bit of a dichotomy here on the panel. You know, if I think about Eileen and JP Morgan, you know, you guys are probably building a lot of your technology in house. Um, you know, for us as a smaller RIA firm, you know, we're using a lot of vendor provided platforms. But I think the point remains the same in either environment, and and you know, leveraging a lot of what Andre just said, I think just. Ongoing cybersecurity assessments has to be key to any kind of technology implementation, particularly you know ones that are touching clients. Um, you know things are always evolving. You know today we're talking about mobile technology. Tomorrow it's going to be more AI driven or, or other evolutions of technology, and just factoring in ongoing assessments. You know as Andre said, the fraudsters are still working you know nonstop, right? And they're continuing continuously inventing new ways to hack latest technology. The ongoing investment of cybersecurity assessments of your technology is key ensuring that, you know, you've got the right safeguards in place and where you need to, you know, as Wendy said, going back to the clients and saying and explaining, here's why, you know, we've got these protocols in place from a risk management perspective so that you are attacking these security issues, no matter what the technology is from, you know, the right protocols from a cybersecurity perspective, from a process perspective, from a checks and balances perspective. And I think that's got to be, you know, an important ongoing uh, investment of discipline and just, you know, investment of cost, even from a cybersecurity, you know, ongoing perspective. I would totally agree. And, and I also think it comes down to what are your clients trying to do on mobile? You know, we've done a lot of research and analysis, you know, for transaction banking, which is the business I'm in. Our clients really wanting to send a $5 million transaction through the mobile app, or are they really looking for it to be more informative and just to know what's gone through, what hasn't been approved, what actions they need to take. So I think, you know, when we think about security and about product development, sometimes you're like, oh, we can't do this. It's too hard. But sometimes we need to take a step back and say, what do clients really want to do? You know, are we trying to build everything into something that, frankly, they're not going to use or they're not going to be comfortable with or they don't have the need for? You know, a lot of our clients are saying, I'm sitting in front of my computer all day long. That's how I do transactions. But if I'm in a meeting, I want to know what's happening when I'm not sitting in front of my computer so I can see what happens. So I think it's understanding the client need and what they're trying to do, especially when it comes to comes to mobile. Yeah, and that's always going to vary quite a bit. Like what what does the client want to do? Uh, you know, which client are you talking about and how much customization and personalization do you really need to build in? And that's, I think, where AI really comes in handy, um, you know, just to be able to personalize in, you know, umpteen different ways. Yeah, I think for us, one of the things that is very important um, when it comes to technology and, um, you know, mobile banking or online banking is when it doesn't work. Like, what do you do, right? When they call yeah. you, I mean, nobody likes to call their banks. Usually it's when you have a problem, then you call your bank. But, you know, mm -hmm. how do you make sure that when things don't work and they call you, it's a pleasant experience and their problem gets resolved immediately. I think to us, you know, it's it's very important um, to address that part. Yeah. All right. I, um, I think we'll move on a little bit here and talk shift gears a little bit to talk about how you're measuring success when it comes to customer experience. Because everyone talks a lot about, you know, uh, boy, we want to improve our customer experience. We are, we have a great customer experience. Um, and there's lots of different ways to measure that. I think initially the, the first thought people might have is, oh, well, you know, we're, we're looking at MPS or CSAT or, you know, whatever, you know, customer rating that you're looking at, customer effort score, could be any of those. Um, and that's certainly one way to measure success, but I think there are other ways to measure success, you know, revenue, costs, um, and maybe you guys have other ones, but I'd like to really understand how are you measuring success in your customer experience? So whoever would like to start, jump right in. Sure, I can go. So um, for, for client experience, we're focused on 
time. See, that course that, like you mentioned, Robin, that's only one dynamic. And mm -hmm. what we found is we really can't just focus on the score. It's really what is the commentary behind the score? What are they saying? What are the trends that are happening? And really deep diving into that. Because I've seen instances where people are reporting out a score. They have an 8 out of 10. Well, that's great. But how many people give you a 2? And what are they focused on? Was it a platform right. issue? Was it a design issue? Was it something else? And so my team is really focused on understanding what that is, and we literally read every client comment and understand how do we need to to think about this in the main uh, the main strategy that we're working on. I think we're also looking at how do we reduce call volume. Like when he said, you know, no one really wants to call. You know, no one is looking to like let me call my bank today. I think they want to to solve things with self service or find another way to find the answer, or frankly, just have easy designs so you don't even have to guess what you're supposed to be doing on an online or mobile platform. So that's one of the other things. Are we reducing call volumes? Are we increasing call volumes, especially when we roll out something new or we make changes? You know, no one likes change. As much as we like to think every client wants something new every month, mm -hmm. you know, frankly, they don't because then they can relearn it. it impacts their work process, you know? So we really have to think about that. And certainly we look at revenue, we look at usage, we're looking at um, how often people are, you know, logging into something. We really want to measure the entire client journey. Where do they stop? Where do they start? What, did, what you know, journey are they taking versus what are the three other journeys they can take and what's most useful? So we're experimenting in that as well, but there's a lot of ways to look at it. I think it's really just being aligned, you know, for us, for CSA and some other metrics, we're aligned between our design team, client experience, my team, product, technology, marketing. I think that's really the key. Everyone has to be kind of focused on the same goals and understand what that goal is. And you can make a huge difference if everyone is moving in the same direction. You know, I mean, I, think yeah, I, mean, I would echo everything that Eileen said. Go ahead, Ben. Yeah, sorry, Robin. Uh, yeah, I was just gonna say, I completely echo everything that Eileen said, you know, just in terms of the, the hat that I wear, you know, sort of the day-to-day -day operations, you know, we look at the efficacy of our processes, right? You know, from the moment we get completed paperwork back from clients, how quickly are we getting the accounts opened, right? And so even just the, the belt and suspenders of how you run a business, right? And the efficiencies there, are we efficient? Are, is it easy for clients to open accounts and do business with us and where things are taking longer than we would anticipate? going into the weeds of a process and seeing where the bottlenecks are, right? And how can we alleviate those bottlenecks? So I think um, even just looking at your own shop and seeing how you execute your day to day, you know, where are there opportunities to continuously enhance, whether it's through automation, bottlenecks mm -hmm. in terms of resourcing, maybe it's just not the right skill set, the right training. I mean, there could be a multitude of reasons why things are slowing down or, or are inefficient, right? So I think just having metrics to evaluate and then assess, okay, how can we continuously do things better, I think is, is an important lens to also look at. Yeah, I mean, data yes. is definitely it, key. If I could I comment. I mean, and Viv talked about how important data is. I think data and just having that data, having the analytics program to, to basically make sense of that data is so, so important to measuring its success, no matter what metric you're looking at. But the other comment I wanted to make too um, was just having those cross-disciplinary teams, Eileen. I think a lot of companies don't do this. Um, and I think it's, and I don't, and I don't underestimate how hard it is to do it, but to get these teams together across multiple disciplines to be working together all the time. Um, uh, there's a, a great gentleman from Vanguard named Dennis Becton who's done this very, very well, and he's spoken about it in other, uh, other you know, areas, um, other conferences and things like that. But where he's really put together, and he just really wanted to do this. It wasn't something he was even, you know, charged with doing. He just sort of got all these teams together on an executive level, um, different levels of people, and different. Um, you know, business units all literally physically working together when they're in the office, but physically working in the same places to really make a difference in how their customers are, you know, actually uh, what, what kind of experience they're getting. So I think that's just one of those things that is so important. And Viv, it's probably something that you work on too, just being a COO, you know, just trying to get teams together, um, I, I think is pretty important. But anyway, uh, Andre, I think you were about to say something. So please go ahead. You know, I, I just wanted to comment that um, in, in our case, what we're seeing is that um, security was always kind of a, a cost reduction 
uh, at, at the organizations. Uh, and, and now that we are like bringing this new uh, authentication techniques that are frictionless and, 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 and provide a better customer experience, we're seeing security becoming more of a, a revenue uh, a growing function, right? We're, we're seeing them uh, as, as I mentioned, like removing steps of the process and that leads to higher conversion uh, that also leads to fewer false positives. So you're denying uh, uh, fewer good customers in this case. Uh, so it's it's interesting to see that transitioning from a cost reduction function to, okay, how can security be leveraged to, to in increase revenues as well? Yeah. I think in addition to, you know, um, the cost analysis, which is very important um, to build the right customer experience for us, we're a big belief that you need to align um, compensation with people's behavior. Mm. If you're encouraging something, you need to make sure that the pay structure also reflects that. And that is something that, you know, I think um, maybe an approach that we are taking that is a little different. That's a really good point, you know, just to, to encourage people through compensation. I think that's a, uh... That's definitely a good one. Um, okay. So I know we only have, yeah, I'm just looking at the time, we have, left, we have about 10 minutes left. So I think at this point, just because I know we're already running a little bit late today, I'm going to go to our closing question and give each of you a little bit of, you know, so a little bit of time to answer it. Um, what's the single most important technology that you have or that you plan to implement that's going to improve customer experience? Wendy, let's start with you. I think for us, the single most important technology is our fully digitalized end-to-end um, -end platform because this tech enable process um, provides on point, quick turnaround on our underwriting, due diligence, onboarding, and data analysis. Also, it offers a holistic view of our client relationship. So for example, you know, if you open up with us, I will be able to see, you know, your commercial account, your line of credit, your personal mortgage, you know, your husband's account, and that, you know, true global view of the relationship also allows us to truly offer a um, relationship pricing to our client. And it also allows us to serve our client a, a lot better because we now have a holistic picture. Um, it's also a great way for us to risk manage because this way, you know, when we are looking at, you know, um, increasing the line of credit, we know that, okay, now you also have all this other relationship with us. This is the strength of the overall financial. So I think for us, you know, having that end-to-end um, -end platform is very important and we'll continue to um, work and improve on the efficiency of that platform. So it's not really a single technology, it's more the, um, the single platform. It's, it's the ability to integrate a lot of different technologies into sort of a, um, a consistent integrated view. Is Correct. that fair? Okay. Yep. All right. Viv, how about you? Yeah, I, I think the way I'd, I'd answer the question, it's not really one specific technology per se, but it's the ongoing mindset, right? It's the fact that here's the ongoing value we want to provide to our clients. You know, today it's obviously, you know, becoming more goals based as opposed to our, our sort of legacy model of investment management. But with that, here's the corresponding experience we want our clients to have, right? So how do we have technology in place that delivers it? How do we have our technology talking to each other, as you guys just talked about with integration, right? You know, that we're not in the swivel chair mentality of entering the same data multiple times, right? And having it entered once through a golden source with data yeah. integrity and the data is propagated, right? Um, again, roles and responsibilities, Robin, as you asked about earlier with you know, cross-functional teams, how do we optimize our client service teams spending all of their time with clients and not sort of bogged down with non-client facing operational work and that we've got the right operational staff in place to then take care of the non client facing work, but then again, but that comes the handoff of data and tasks and responsibilities, right? And ensuring that integration and, and, and the training is in place, right? So it's just an ongoing dialogue and evaluation of, of those things and then making the investments where we need to, to have the technology do a lot of the heavy lifting for us. Okay. So more an ongoing mindset and a dialogue, not a specific technology. All right, you guys are doing a great job at not specifically answering my question, but you are giving some great information here. <laughs> um, I don't know, I, you know, from my perspective, I, I, I agree with both Wendy and its item. I think one thing that I would say I'm very excited about and that JP Morgan, you know, already has a huge um, 
investment in is, you know, artificial intelligence. I mean, I think for us and even for my team, we spend a lot of time still doing kind of manual processes, going through feedback, kind of doing, you know, this, yeah. this analysis work. As, as we can invest more and more in AI, which we have already, and we're testing and learning because at the same time, it's a tricky balance because you want to have that personal relationship with the customer and you don't want to send everything through a machine to analyze that. Yeah. But to Viv's point, if you can do that for really simple things, you know, where, you know, you could identify patterns that happen and get ahead of those client questions so that you can spend more time with clients on more important issues than, I've logged myself out again of, of our online platform. How do I find my password? How do I reset my password? Those sorts of things. Or I, you know, I sent a, an international wire the last time was two years ago. I don't remember how to do that. So can we leverage our virtual assistant to help guide that process? But they don't have to call the help desk, right? We can utilize some of those um, AI technologies to do that. Again, it's still a tricky balance, right? Because, you know, you're giving a lot of, well, some pieces of control over because of going through the data and analysis and sometimes it's, you know, it's not always right. When we've done analyses, you know, AI is not 100% foolproof. You need that human oversight of it. But I think that can be really key because then those sort of repeatable tasks you can apply there and then you can free up more time, especially in times like this where I think everyone's constrained, right? There's not enough people and too much to do in every firm that, you know, that I've spoken to people at. So how do we work smarter? Yeah, and I mean, I think the last thing you need to do is to have your more highly paid or more experienced or more educated agents dealing with, hey, what's your overnight mailing address, you know? I mean, those basic questions are exactly what AI virtual assistants are, are for. And I think over time, the virtual assistants will be able to do more and do more complex functions. But I, I totally agree with your point that you can you can certainly free up that agent time to spend more time, you know, they're, they're not rushed then on the call. So in, in some ways it does more to improve and personalize that relationship that you have with your customers, because now you're spending more time with them. It also enables you to hire people who are more skilled and more experienced because you don't need the entry level people anymore. The AI is doing a lot of those entry level functions. All right. So great, great thought there. So um, AI and by extension, I think automation was another, you know, an extension of what you were saying, Eileen. So Andre, what do you think? Um, what do you think is the, the most important uh, and key technology right now in improving customer experience? I can probably guess what you're going to say, but I'll, yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll open the door for you. <laughs> yeah, perfect. Well, um, yeah, I'm, I'm definitely biased here, but but I believe that uh, frictionless authentication is 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 the main technology uh, because if not, it, like. Uh, authentic authentication is present in every single customer interaction uh, we have with a financial services company, right? We, the moment we call the call center, the moment we log into the mobile app, the moment that we go to an ATM, we have to authenticate, right? Um, so why don't we use this device that we we have with us all the time, at, in, independently if we're using uh, uh, an ATM, if we, we are at the physical branch, if we are calling the call center, or if we're using the mobile app, we're we're going to be using the same device, right? So why don't we use uh, what is most differentiated about it uh, in terms of understanding the behavior of that person to authenticate that person throughout all of those different interactions, right? Uh, because in our case here, uh, when, when we talk about location behavioral biometrics, for example, we're not talking only about the mobile application, right? Uh, if you are at, at an ATM, we're going to analyze if the uh, uh, from your mobile device is close to that ATM. If you are at a physical branch, we're going to try to understand also if your phone is, is there, right? Um, and, and also if you are calling the call center, we're trying to understand from where you're calling, if you're calling from a safe place like your home or somewhere else, right? So, so we're talking about something that is ubiquitous uh, across all of the different customer interactions and can help remove friction from the process as well as obviously improve security because you, you don't want also to to remove friction from the authentication process and, and no longer have security because then you're going to have another problem which is uh, people people having uh, uh, fraud and, and having to deal with, with a lot of other problems and losing money, right? So uh, I, I think we're in a, an interesting new phase. 
All right. Well, excellent. I, I think we ended up with uh, a, a really great list of key enabling technologies to improve customer experience and very different, you know, so from Winnie's digital platform, which is kind of a, you know, a, a consolidation of a lot of technologies, but the integration itself, it's almost like the integration is what's important there and the ability to see from end to end, you know, what, what your customers are doing. Um, Vib, you know, gets into the, you know, the more operational issues, the ongoing mindset and the dialogue that you have. Um, internally with your with your um, employees as well as externally with your customers and then making everything that you do from a technology perspective be goals based, which I think is another really important way to look at things. Um, Eileen, to your point about AI and automation, I mean, that's where our research is showing that you know so much from a technology perspective anyway that's that's where things are really heading in the customer experience space we heard a lot of presentations about that today just being able to automate being able to use artificial intelligence and machine learning to do exactly um you know what we need to do uh, to, to improve that customer experience and to eliminate the things that humans don't really need to do uh, and then and then finally the frictionless authentication so just being able to um, especially in in this industry this is a very important uh you know area making sure that as people come in whatever channel they're coming in that they're authenticated and that overall you have improved security because of the information you're getting from that authentication process